Welcome you all back to Human Humane Architecture, broadcasting here live from Honolulu, Hawaii. So from our tropical, exotic, cosmopolitan, coastal metropolis. And so we're going to have uh, our co-host, uh, Ron Lindgren, with us, live from Long Beach, California. Hi, Ron. Hello, Martin. Glad to be with you again to talk a little bit more about the Harbor Square project. Absolutely. And today it's only the two kids from the Harbor Square block because our uh, third member of the triumvirate, uh, De Soto, cannot be with us today, but he will make him join next week again. So we're, we're on our own today, but we will do our very best. So why don't we go to the uh, first slide and you do a little recap of what volume one was, Ron. Yeah, I thought it would be a good idea to have a short recap on what we discussed about Harbor Square last week. Uh, designed 50 years ago by the architect Ed Killingsworth, Harbor Square is an early and a rare example of a large multi-use urban development in downtown Honolulu. It entails an entire city block, and it's located right at the very junction of that city's business and government districts. The project encompassed condominiums that had ocean, mountain, and city views, office space, a very busy restaurant, a historic sailor's hotel, and a lot of supporting parking. 360 one- and two-bedroom condos, all furnished with spacious lanais, are located in two 20-story towers. And those towers rest on a recreation deck with a swimming pool, which in essence is the roof of a six-story podium that contains all of the other facilities in this architecturally distinguished and humane development. If you look at the picture in the upper left of this first slide, uh, to the, uh, the tower at the right in that picture is the Harbor Tower. Of particular interest at Harbor Square is the fact that the architect designed the two condo towers ostensibly for two very different sets of buyers. The Harbor Tower, again, as I said on the right, was envisioned as being a home for businessmen and government officials who had probably worked in downtown Honolulu for years and had created or certainly established some, some uh, significant professional careers. Though they were provided with one garage parking space for, uh, per condo, these men and women could now easily appreciate walking to work. And that's my recap, Martin. Yeah, and, and, and on the bottom left, you can see how the units in this tower look like. The pictures on the right, I worked in as of this morning because based upon your recommendation and our exotic escapism expert, Susanna, I went back to my Walrafian research ritual in the morning through your Halekolani and I ran into Nathan and uh, on the slide at the top right you can see yourself and Nathan talking and he was the one who approached you when you were there last time around your uh, keynote speech of the Documomus Symposium and he has said hey I haven't seen you in a while actually since the 80s I haven't seen you and obviously he remembered you and he says hi, and I was telling him about the show we're going to do today. And he very enthusiastically shared his memories of something that relates to the picture at the bottom, at the bottom right, that we actually forgot to uh, report about the last time we were talking about the very uh, multifunctionality and multi-use of the building. And what was that, Ron? Well, of. Uh... Originally, and facing out on the busy Alamoana Boulevard, it was quite a large restaurant uh, operated by a local restaurateur. It wasn't a chain restaurant. Very busy because, again, uh, being right at the junction of the high-rise business downtown and the more low-rise governmental buildings, breakfast was busy with uh, all kinds of people uh, there before walking to work. Lunch was busy. Nighttime dinners were maybe a little slower, but there were plenty of people who had uh, overtime and could catch a meal there before they went back to their offices again. The fact is that there was a, a nicer garden there than what is shown in the photo, and that uh, strange concrete wall wasn't there. Uh, in fact, it was really exciting to sit in that all-glazed side of the restaurant 
looking out at the traffic roaring by uh, all day long. That's what Nathan was saying. He even had memories before that, which gives us an idea how the place was originally. He said his father dropped him off when he was a kid, so they were doing spear fishing in the harbor. You wouldn't see that that much these days anymore. And uh, there was a surf shop just next door, and he said we, we looked over and saw this restaurant, uh, all open floor to ceiling glass, which there still is, but unfortunately now it's boarded up and some office space and there even storage. So our pitch is basically bring this back, put a restaurant back in. And so it makes me remember, you know, which I can't remember because I wasn't here. It took me until we will talk about that in the next show, the two decades later in the early nineties, when I finally came to what I consider to be the Holy land, the America, but the RPIing mobile that we were cruising around that you see at the top right was actually uh, designed and basically introduced and, and available to buy at the same time, early 70s. And so uh, the early 70s is actually a time that was critical for you as far as your history where the Killingsworth office, because 1970 was that very special year. And why don't you share with the audience what happened in 1970 and also why you think your future boss and friend at Killingsworth actually hired you. And that also has to do with it. One show we dedicated to Veterans Day last year. And yesterday we had Martin Luther King Day. So this is uh, remembering the heroes. So please share with the audience that story. Yeah, uh, 1970 uh, is when I mustered out of the Navy as, as an officer in the Seabees, and I literally walked up Long Beach Boulevard from the Naval uh, uh, naval Station in the city of Long Beach up to Ed Killingsworth's office. Uh, I wasn't thinking that I would be hired, so the big surprise was that after I walked in and talked to people in his office and to Ed, uh, I was hired uh, on as a beginning draftsman. Um, I found out later that it wasn't. It certainly wasn't the uh, the work that I had shown that I had done in college, which wasn't particularly uh, <laughs> uh, earth shaking. But Ed had been drafted into the military after his uh, university time at the University of Southern California, and so for almost five years of his young life was spent in World War II. Well. Uh, I had graduated from MIT with a graduate degree, and then in the very last month of the Vietnam draft, before the draft w was ended, I got my call. And so uh, the last portion of my young life, almost three and a half years, were also spent in military service. Ed appreciated that, remembered what he had gone through, and that's really the reason he hired me. It's only luckily that I turned out to have been able to develop some talent and actually contribute to the achievements that his office made during the 30 years that I was there. Well, thanks to the humble and understated guy you are, but I would say I align myself with all respect that he intuitively hired you for the real reason of living up to, the, to his ethics in, in practice, as we can say it, and his you know, um, philosophy. In, in the sort of applied build environment. And so that, um, you know, the, the restaurant at the bottom also sort of made us think about since we got the audience excited to, you know, join in because of that fascinating, mysterious story of the principals and the secretaries. So we said, you know, they might have actually then come down and had some lunch or dinner together. And let's go to the next slide and actually check out where the secretaries then when they went back up where they lived and explain a little bit the layout of that tower. On. Yeah, in, in the, the, uh, the town tower uh, contains smaller and less expensive one and two bedroom condo, condo units. And they were th therefore were more affordable to younger buyers, those new to Honolulu and just beginning their business, governmental and political careers. Ed Killingsworth considered these to be perhaps interns, secretaries, bank tellers, political aides, law clerks, junior accountants, etc. There is no parking provided for the town tower condos. So for these folks, these younger folks, walking to nearby work is mandatory. Also, tower residents have no 
personal condo washer dryer hookups and must use a community laundry facility. Mm -hmm. uh, so this was a younger group. And in, uh, in this slide, we were looking at the typical uh, town tower floor plans. This reveals that the 160 condo units all had lanai's. These were, as you can see, simple rectangular constructions that were considerably less expensive to build than the harbor towers, mm -hmm. lanai's, which were much larger and involved uh, some curvilinear shapes in plan. Absolutely. But nonetheless, each resident of the town tower had a five foot deep by 20 foot long lanai and easily furnished outdoor room. And if we go to the next slide, you can see one of the four corner units, uh, two bedroom units. And that uh, very spacious lanai that I'm mentioning encompasses both the living room and the bedroom. And nicely enough, four out of eight of the units on each floor, that is 50%, were corner units, which helped to develop a sort of diagonal natural cross ventilation and less need to rely on air conditioning except for the worst and muggiest days. Yeah, and I want to add to that. And, and by the way, at the top left might have been one of the secretaries we're talking about who was Oh, yes. <laughs> and, and one thing I want to point out, because I don't have that luxury, although my building is very nice by um, Ernest Hara and the Waikiki Grand, but I have a trapped bathroom, and the main bathroom here also has natural ventilation because it's basically fronting the exterior facade, and that's certainly a big luxury, especially in the tropics, to basically vent out the humidity you bring in through being in the bathroom, right? And indeed, uh, there was the possibility of sitting in a tub and having a view out uh, over the lanai uh, to, to the far distance. Wow. So let's check this out, how it looked on the lanai. Let's go to the next slide here. Yeah, this shows that someone loves and is using their lanai because it's furnished. Uh, and you can see that it is all floor-to-ceiling glass all, all the way across. Uh, just off in the near distance is the recreation uh, deck. Uh, and, and in fact, in the next slide, we'll see that that recreation deck was furnished with quite a handsome swimming pool uh, uh, and recreation area. And in the next slide, it shows just one of quite a few sort of shade pavilions that were uh, created as places for parties or just to get out of the sun. And the fact is, it's very possible that employers and, and their own employees sort of shared those recreational facilities uh, regularly. And I've always wondered, as a sort of so, uh, sociological experiment, just how that worked out. I cannot report on that, but it's an interesting idea. You're talking about the principals and the secretaries, Ryan. Indeed. You know, we don't want to be come across as machos here, so we, we're talking, you know, in these days at least, luckily, we're um, sort of um, gender discrimination is hopefully a little less than it was uh, way back. It could go both ways, right? You could have a female boss and you'd be a... Uh, male assistant as well but you know this might have been the place and the space besides the restaurant where they could actually meet the little pavilion i want to point out here is is special because it actually shares uh, many uh, or several of the other killingsworth projects that we've been talking about in the past and actually we will your partner larry stricker is actually heading out to uh his project uh the manalani on the big island and then ihilani he basically um was uh, sort of doing these little folly pavilions that, that fully basically uh, implemented the, the vocabulary of what Don Hibbert calls the flying trellises and the flying beams. But we were puzzled that actually this is only sort of really implemented in this sort of very um, expressive way in this sort of substructure while the tower almost we feel bad about the term, but we couldn't find any better one, almost feels amputated, that there are indications of that where the basically the volume stop, that something wanted to project out, but then they also, they almost seem to be cut off. Do you have an idea why that might have been, Ron? Uh, 
Are you talking about uh, the next slide where there was kind of an amputated version of some Killingsworth structural work? Well, and, well, no, actually, the, we can go to the next slide already, but I'm actually talking about the tower itself, because in the tower itself, once, you know, the tower reaches its end, or even where the podium reaches the end, there are sort of beams almost wanting to come out, but then they don't do it, then they're cut off. And you pointed oh, uh, to one, and you I, said, I, this looks really odd, right? And we can't really figure, Be because in yeah, the... Yeah, I, I have to admit that that, that is strange, because... Uh, typically, Ed would have uh, well-proportioned beam extensions going out quite a ways, which helps to provide a cap to, to the tower, yeah. uh, a very visible roof. And for some reason, and it couldn't have been cost because uh, there wouldn't have been much concrete involved, some forming, yes, but they're, they're rather stubby there, and I've never, I never had the chance to ask Ed how that came about, unfortunately. Yeah, and in these days, you could, I mean, I, from practice, I had this happen many times. You call this very dirty American term of value engineering. But uh, way back in the 70s, we were been reporting on the former seaside now shoreline tower where Ed actually with LE, they were the developers, so it was their money, and they still afforded them while here, you know, there must have been a decently affluent client. And we can only wonder why this is the most sort of amputated of these very uh, signature style of the Killingsworth um, oeuvre kind of work, right? And so now we're like with that being the case, almost across the street, going back uh, Diamond Head, there is this little uh, now Chevrolet dealership that actually has them in a, in a very over-exaggerated way. And so this is a, actually a good example that Ed was, uh, and you guys were actually informing with your avant-garde work, the mainstream of architecture in some very profane building types as a car dealership. So, you know, th that is pretty, and, and you have an example on your very own that actually we might want to share in the next show because you're, you're living in one of these examples, right? Indeed. So you're living in a in a developer home that that is a spec you know project uh, from some while ago that is not designed by your firm, but it feels very much like it, right? Because again, there was yeah. this sort of inspiration from you guys for the mainstream. Yeah, what I'd say is that my own home, which I'm uh, uh, excited to uh, show people uh, in next week's program, is kind of a contractor's version of the very famous and iconic uh, Southern California mid-century modern architecture from that period of about 1945 to 1970. Mm -hmm. A contractor's draftsman was inspired by Killingsworth architecture and designed dozens of, con of uh, duplex units, one of one half of which I live in. Yeah, and you know, back to this car dealership here, I mean, if I look at the, the picture I took at night on the way back from one show last year, and the, doesn't the, the, how the beams and the little sub uh, columns reach the very thin slab, uh, you know, roof very much be reminiscent of, of the Kahala Hilton, the very first project, right? I mean, this yeah, is it's definitely, it's definitely the Kahala Hilton lobby, exactly. but the columns are amputated at about mid height. So the whole thing ends up being sort of a yeah. squat yeah, yeah, assemblage, yeah. whereas the Kahala lobby is quite a soaring space exactly and talking uh a contractor the contractor's favorite car is the ford f-150 and they're sold here and i want to hijack one of these for the moment of backing them into what they just recently under two of the flying trellises they put these sort of hideous uh buttressed pillars and i want to take them out so i want to you know back the truck into them and make them go down because doesn't need that flying trellises have to fly right but again this good is, luck with that yeah this is a nice piece here again informed by you guys so uh, let's go to the next slide and contemplate a little more this is actually uh, just to demonstrate the sort of pioneering um relevance of of the harbor square tower it, it was pretty much the tower that was preceding all these later projects here that I took pictures of while walking through downtown. And they all don't live up uh, to 
the elegance and uh, excellence and performance on multiple levels as we keep talking about of Harper Square. They're very hermetic. They're very lanai deprived. We can go to the next slide. Uh, here all the way through the, the 90s, right? Uh, they have either no lanais or they have very sort of, you know, not worth the term balconies. So that's, it's sad that, you know, obviously that was sort of value engineered, I guess, here comes the term again. But again, it, it just speaks even more for what sort of a pioneering treasure Harbor Square is within this typology, right? Indeed. Uh, why don't we go to the next slide? Yeah, what I'd like to say here is uh, Ed, uh, Ed, Ed was a bit was certainly a hero of mine, but I found this particular view of the ocean-facing elevation of the Harbor Tower to be rather heroic in its sort of classical symmetry, mm -hmm. uh, and the fact that it is adorned with working uh, and large lanais. Uh, is much to his credit. Yeah, and I threw in the pictures at the top because it reminds me of when I finally was able to come to the Holy Land, uh, America, me, the German Americano, I, as a student in 1990, so two decades after this was built, the uh, sort of embodiment of that sort of heroic, uh, patriotic American zeitgeist was still around, embodied by the car I couldn't resist to buy, which is my 72 Plymouth Fury up there at the bottom left. So exactly almost a year later the build, after the building was completed. So there, and you can see the similarity, right? Both are boxy, but then they have this sort of soft edged, sexy curvedness, you know, within in their detail. And now if we do the math, Happy New Year 2020, we're talking 1970, do the math, that's 50 years. And that's why we threw in Historic Hawaii Foundation, the building is now ready to be on the register. And again, as we use vehicles as, or cars as vehicles for thought, again, when I bought this car that while ago, I bought it for $600 because it was considered to be a junky big boat. I look them up now, they're like in the 10 grand. So that is the same with, with the building, not only as you described the building as being heroic and special, and it's certainly also of one of the architects who in gets increasingly more appreciated uh, despite his sort of humbleness and, and, and understatement to have been one of the most influential American architects and, and you having been with him on that. So again, we want to obviously then tell people, the owners and the, the tenants in here, be aware of what you have and, and go and sign up and go to Don Hibbert and put this on the register to have it been more protected and be more recognized of uh, more than a young timer because then it's going to be an old timer, right? Yes. Uh, jump to the next slide. Yeah, let me jump in here. Uh, these are obviously uh, realtor ads for units that are available in fact uh, today now at Harbor Square. And although uh, Ed's one and two bedroom units seem spacious, they actually in terms of square footage weren't all that particularly large. For example, one bedrooms ran from 590 to 865 square feet. And the two bedrooms could have been as small as 740 square feet. And the largest of them, 1,180 square feet. And when you consider fee simple and leasehold prices for those units, it ranges uh, from about $325,000 for a one bedroom to 660,000 uh, for two bedrooms. And that, those are today's prices. And that you can, that's almost a steal, especially considering what you get for the buck, right? You get a classic and, and you get it for a very reasonable price. I mean, this is almost social housing doesn't exist in America, but affordable housing, what they call here. And what do you get in all the developments? You get these hermetic AC invasive boxes and here you get a real good uh, heroic american piece of architecture that next slide um is um our mandatory bioclimatic check and while you know and the top right is is obviously the beginning of you guys work uh, kahala hotel and kahala condos and for different reasons 
they're very bioclimatic. Harbor square in all things admitted and granted depends on the orientation. And at the bottom right, you see that west sun setting. So if you are having the view that we just saw in the previous picture with the ocean view, you obviously also are faced with um, the, the sun. While if you have a unit that actually the one that Ad had and you were in, as I recall correctly, was looking diamond head. So you actually experienced how the lanai was shading it pretty efficiently, if effectively, right, Ron? One thing I might say, however, is that the harbor uh, tower is pretty much square, and there are units looking out in four directions. Yeah. If this were, if this had been designed uh, today, uh, I, as an architect, would have not just treated all four sides exactly the same. There should have been uh, uh, a greater reaction to the east-west exposures, which can be brutal. I I'm um, glad you say that as a message to the emerging post-fossil generation, Ron. Thank you very much. And we're, believe it or not, we're almost at the end of the show, but one more slide here, please. Um, all that being said, being self-critical of, which is relative to a really great work. Uh, this picture you see on the right here were the buddies of, I think, Architects Hawaii, who got totally taken away by international style and an invasive hermetic box. Uh, you guys were doing and the firm you joined that year for for the reasons uh, we keep talking about all things considered it had lanai's and depending on the orientation the lanai was helping you also had something that you usually don't do anymore these days dedicating some uh, facade uh, exterior facade to opacity that helps to keep the sun out and then what you pointed out you have sliding doors on all sides so you can have at the corner you know as, as shown here cross ventilation or what we call side ventilation which I unfortunately took away in the remodeling of your waikiki park hotel to the halepuna so that being said uh we're at the end of volume two needless to say we're very excited about volume three which we will actually share some uh sort of uh what if ideas right because originally the this project was supposed to be developed by another architect that we will talk about. And then I raised the question um, if this is actually um, how many other uh, condominium towers are there in the Killingsworth oeuvre? And the answer to that question we will share with you guys next week. So until then, thank you, Ron. Um, thank you, Martin. Have a um, good time. We have a lot to prepare for the next show. It's going to be an exciting one again. So until then, stay uh, as uh, exotically erotic as these buildings we were talking about. And see you all then. Bye bye.